Welcome to At The Table, I'm Audrey Galix. Thanks so much for being with us. This entire program is devoted to women who push the envelope, who dare to speak the truth. And in the first half of our show, I am speaking with a woman who has self-declared herself Royal Rebel, and that is the title of her book, Royal Rebel. With me is Princess Soma Noradam from Cambodia. Actually, you were born, Soma, in the States, but... I, I mean, was actually born in Cambodia, ah. and I was the first refugee here in 1975. Um, and we actually came here because my dad was helping the U.S. Air Force because he was a lieutenant general in the Cambodian Air Force. And at that time, you, we were the U.S. was stationed in Cambodia, and also in Thailand, and it was based in Thailand. And when the Khmer Rouge regime came in in 1975 in April, the first plane out to the U.S was 250 pilots of my dad's, my dad, my mom, and us kids oh coming gosh. here. Oh my gosh, may I be so bold as to ask, how old were you at the time? I'm um, four. You were four, do you have any conscious memory of that or any mm, conscious memory of Cambodia? Just uh, a dress that we had to run to the plane and because there were bombs throughout, I mean, all over the country and we were in, even in Thailand, so just a ripped dress. We just had a dress and that was it wow. as a so kid. So once you got to the States, what, what did you learn about your history, your heritage? Nothing. Um, the history book doesn't talk about it. Uh, my family doesn't talk about it. Uh, during the 1975 to 79, which they called the darkest days in Cambodia, was when the Khmer Rouge regime came in, took over the country, killed two million people of our own people. And did you Khmer know what was going on? No, did you? no. until my first uh, like glimpse of what happened was in 1984, 85, when the movie The Killing Field, and it was Oscar nominated. We watched the movie. My dad could not watch it. See, a lot of the elders could not watch movies like that because it affected them, because their family died there. And some of them do have PTSD because it affected them. So they don't really want to talk about it. So I didn't know anything about my country and my history, the culture. Did your folks speak the language at home? Though? They did, but we grew up as American, Cambodian American, and we went to school and you were in, in, California. in California, so we had to learn English. Um, so I can understand Khmer at that time, but I had to learn to speak English, and my mom and dad was speaking English to us. So us kids growing up in the U.S. as Cambodian Americans spoke English, listened to our parents in Khmer. Sometimes my parents would speak Khmer and English together in the language, you know, the right, sentence, right. yeah. Did you ever feel um, discriminated against at all? Or people call you, you know, think you were Vietnamese or? Yes, um, you know, I'm not to say in California, but I know I had a lot of Cambodian American friends who now tell me that, oh, it affected me too, but I was living in Massachusetts. But we were the first one in California and they didn't know who refugees were. And so they would call us names, tease us growing up when you're in elementary school and junior high. And you know, in you're in junior high and stuff, and when you, you know, kids are, can be mean. Yeah, yeah, across the board. Yeah, matter. so it doesn't yeah. matter. And then for you to be a refugee to come mean, they were calling us names. I mean, we still think about it. Um, it. It scarred us. You know, we would ask our parents, why are they calling us? Of course, our parents couldn't explain it. Um, we had to just, you know, grow up and we had to deal with it. Um, we had to have a strong, uh, thick skin is what you call it. Now, did you have any idea that you were descendant from royalty in Cambodia? You know, I just know it's a name. We don't talk about it. Uh, coming here in the U.S., I was just Soma, growing up, going to school, like an all-American girl. Um, no, I just, we don't really talk about it until when I went back. And, of course, the Nordum is a royal family name by, it's the down, generations. yeah, generations, generations and generations. Mm -hmm. So your father decided in his last years, uh, when he was ill, to go back to Cambodia. That must have been a difficult decision. I mean, I know some people who, you know, would not, you know, ever want to go back, you know, shut the door, this is my life. How did he decide to go back? Well, it was already when the doctor said, you know, you only have a couple years. He was on dialysis in California. And, you know, his last wish, and he's Buddhist. And a lot of Buddhists um, would like to f pass away in their homeland, have their ashes, their ashes yeah, yes. cremated. Mm -hmm. And his 
was he wants to have his ashes cremate where the Tonsi Lat River and the Mekong River meets, which is right there, right in the heart of Phnom Penh, kind of right in front of the royal palace. So we had to fulfill it. My brother and sister, you know, was like, one of us has to go. You know, dad only has a few years. So my sister, Seda, went first in 2009, but she was, she just finished law school. She didn't start her career yet. And I was kind of established already. So I said, okay, since I'm the oldest, in 2010, made the decision to leave everything behind here. It was the hardest thing. And but you had I, your master's degree I had, in mass I had communications? My mass communication. Um, I, I had a career. I had a boyfriend. I had friends. I was really happy. And then suddenly I hear this, and I decided I have to do it. We only, I only have one father. We only have one father. Your career can come and go. You can always find another career, another job, another boyfriend. So. That was a decision I made, and I was right here in Atlanta, and I made that decision telling, you know, my friends, I'm going to move there, I'm going to stay there, I'm going to fulfill my father's wish, and we'll see what happens. Well, talking about see what happens, did you have any idea how it would change your life? You went there, you became, what, the first English language yes, talk I show, create radio? Yes, I create the very first English-speaking radio talk show. What's great is you can use your skills that you learn here in the U.S., and you can implement it in countries like Cambodia, and things like radio here that we take for granted in countries like Cambodia is the number one medium and that's that's what they have. I mean now we have you know everyone's on Facebook, we have Wi Fi now, but radio is still the number one communication tool in we're not even talking about the city, we're talking about the province, the the country area. So people actually listen to the radio still for information. So when I created that, I thought, wow, I am going to continue my career in broadcasting and, and journalism, and I can maybe help people and help the country. So what challenges did you face as a... Oh, <laughs> you know, Audrey, like quite a few. in a country of Cambodia where it's governed and controlled by the government, you cannot see a lot of things on the radio. Everything's you dared monitored. to do that? Well, it took me a while to at the end, but it wasn't until I was a columnist. But the radio, the technology, of course, um, controlled not just by the government, but controlled by the people who are in charge. Like that time, Panasaswa University of Cambodia was the, comp the, country, the company I work for, which is the biggest university in the city, in Phnom Penh, and they also have it in the province. But it was toward English, it was, uh, they followed the American system, like the Cal State system. So I was, you know, I was like, I wanted to work for an organization that first is English speaking, and I can maybe give help in freedom. education, give me freedom. So what was great, the radio gave me that freedom to be the on, first English speaking. And you took on some, as you said, difficult con uh, issues and, I and did. government policies. Um, the first couple was just like, just getting to know me, oh, we're gonna interview, um, the, the superstars, the celebrities, the uh, rock band here in Cambodia, you know? And then we get, oh, we'll order, uh, you know, interview professors at the universities, and then we started getting to NGOs. Mm -hmm. And then we started getting into a few government officials. And then we started getting to more of the tough s subjects that you don't really want to talk about. Um, gambling, you can't gamble as Cambodians, which the they electoral do. Electoral system, electoral, I suspect. Yes, the taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, just getting into toward the final interview that I had, I brought a uh, an activist who's a Cambodian American who is known in Cambodia now that she always fights for peace and is in the opposition party. So she's always on their list, if you know what I mean. And the um, the owner and the president, everybody warned me, said, "Don't put her on. Do not put her on. We might, you know, get in trouble. Don't put." Her. I said, "It's my last show." If you get in trouble, all they, have, they can do is just shut down the show, and I'm let's just do it. We had the best rating. At the, I mean, I was already number one in like six provinces, but that last show really did it. And so I understand you were uh, threatened, or you were uh, uh, accused of incitement. Was that the interview that did it, or you no? Know, it was when I when I ended the uh, the radio show, the newspaper, the. Um, the media, the Phnom Penh Post, which was owned by Australia, they own like uh, Myanmar Times, etc., and it was the number one newspaper that actually uh, talks about the government, but not as strong, and it's geared toward expats, foreigners, um, people that because um, it's English speaking, it's an English speaking 
um, version and the Khmer version. And they don't have any ties with the government because the majority of the media is owned by the government, which is owned by the prime minister's daughter and family. So 99.9% .9 of the government, the media is all t biased toward the government, favorable toward the government. So you only have two newspaper, which is the Phnom Penh Post and the Cambodia Daily, which started in the mid 90s when the country, um, when the UN had the election and the country was able to be a democratic country. Um, and you were allowed to have a column. I was allowed to have a column, I was a columnist, but it was the first one and they said, okay, you're gonna be talking about sticky, taboo topics. And I said, like what? Oh, corruption, yes. human trafficking, Gambling, I mean, you were invited. That was part trust. of your job description. They were just saying that. Oh, like, okay. Like, oh, you know, maybe, but, you know. As a joke, kind was, of. Yeah. Yes. As if. As if. But, you know, just come up with some topics and give me 10 topics, and then, you know, you can write it every week, and then we'll, the editor will approve it. Okay, well, I started doing research, Audrey. Remember, I didn't know my country, the culture, the history. So the radio show actually taught me a lot because I interviewed the top people in the country. That includes people in government, NGO, entertainment business, and education. So I learned a lot on my own because they don't tell you. And then the, the as a columnist, you have to research. So I had to write about the topic, what the situation is, the issue, and I try to find resolution. So it's a column that actually, okay, we're gonna, here's the issue, and these are some suggestions of how you can help so what was, was there a particular column that kind of broke the camel's back? Or, you yes, know, you know, I didn't know you? that for three months. It was the number one uh, most read section in the paper. It, wa it wasn't until um, in October, the end of October. So it took like another uh, six months or maybe for me to, to get in trouble. So and what was the sticky topic? Said, you know, I was just talking about my family. We should be united. Because they were uh, it having ha some issues? Yes, what happened was the greatest king of Cambodia, King Father Nordam Sihanouk, died in uh, Beijing. His body had to be shipped over to Cambodia because Buddhists to be cremated. So for, as a Buddhist, you have the first seven days to honor and re pay respect. And then after the cremation, and then you have the 100 day, then you honor the one year, and then you honor the five year. So when his body came, it was, I, I couldn't believe, I was there not as a journalist, I was there as a member of the royal family and this is my family. This is someone who's by blood, he's passed away and I'm gonna go honor him. Well, we weren't even able to see the body that first day when it arrived, I mean, there was so many people that came into the city, millions of people just to just stand, they can't go into the royal palace, but just to be there to pay respect because they do love the king. And here we are, royal family members stuck inside the palace, can't get out. We couldn't even see the body that night when you see the prime minister's family, friends, Chinese investors all seeing the body first. And we are a royal family on the bottom of the uh, staircase just waiting to see, to view the body. It, that must I have been difficult. About, yeah, yeah, I just talked about it. I talked about, I just t told the truth. I just, the next week, because the last couple, what happened with the king when he passed away was all over the news, international news, um, local news, and yeah, we every newspaper, every TV talked about it. So I had to talk about something at the you know about King Sihanouk, and I talked about the funeral, what I saw, and I got in trouble for. Sounds like you were airing a little dirty laundry, something like that. You could like that. say that, but uh -huh. you know, I just was very upset, of course, with what I saw inside the royal palace of my family bickering during a funeral for the greatest king, um, the government controlling us like a puppet. Yes, I got in trouble for that by saying that. Um, but I told the truth. I was there. I was very, um, not angry, but just like shock because I would hear it, but I saw it my own eyes. Hang on a minute, that is a cliffhanger. And I'm gonna make sure you are back after our break. We're talking with Princess Soma Norodom uh, from Cambodia. This is At The Table. We will return in a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back to At the Table. I'm Audrey Galix, and I am talking to a woman who has billed herself as a royal rebel, and that is the title of her book. I'm speaking with Princess Soma Noradam from Cambodia. And before the break, you were talking about uh, when your grandfather's body, oh my, yeah, the, your, King Nordam Sihanouk, was brought back for burial or for mm -hmm. cremation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, death yes. ritual, ritual in Cambodia, mm -hmm. and the family was not allowed to see his body initially. initially see it first, yes. See it first. Oh yes, my you have the prime minister's family, friends, investors. And investors, that's such a kind yes, of funny Yes, I have to, to say that. Because, Investing in what is, but, you know, well, because in the country. The country, yes. A lot of people don't know that. Of course, here I am exposing that, which um, we. We are controlled by a country, and another country is controlling by another country. So right now, Cambodia is just being, it's kind of used as a resource, and if anything ever happens, if there's a war, the most dominant country, China, is going to protect Cambodia. And you, you are speaking truth to power, and that's got to put you in a very difficult position. Yeah, but it's the truth, and I'm sorry that I, I was a journalist, and you have to, I mean, integrity is everything. And when I wrote the, the story, I had backlash from my royal family members, the king, the queen mother, my cousins. The government, of course, uh, threatened me uh, because they accused me of incitement, but it was my royal family, too, that said, you need to retract your column, you need to apologize to the government, to the royal family, what you wrote. It hurt, is hurtful, and I go, but that's what's what we saw. And you even said that, too, and I couldn't even name some people in the book, but I just said, they were there, they saw, they even said, one day you should write a story, and I wrote the following week. I just was doing what I... So what kept you out of prison? I mean, incitement no. seems like a pretty serious yes. kind of thing. Yes, incitement with those, that year there were three people accused of incitement. One was uh, deported, the other one uh, was in jail, and another one was killed. And then there's me, Princess Soma. I and don't you were know. able to continue you know, speaking, or I, I mean, you were able to stay and... You know, Audrey, I... I'm blessed, or there's a, a reason an why I'm here, an angel, there's a reason why I'm here, because not everybody's lucky, and I continued, I did start still writing it, even though, because like I said, the paper is going to promote it, because they're they making readers, money, right. they're making money, of course the government is on me, and on the paper, because th just this year, the other newspaper, the Cambodia Daily, was shut down by the government. And they were saying they had they owe millions of dollars in taxes. That's just, but we'll see. So here I am, you know, my life is in jeopardy. My family, I couldn't even like talk to them because my phone was probably, you know, right. wired. Yeah. And so they're in the U.S. Everyone's going. And the only time my mom would know what's going on with me, she'll turn on the news, and the prime minister is accusing me of something at every event. Princess Soma needs to uh, tell why she wrote this. She needs to tell the truth, retract her column. But yes, I did get threats, and I did get um, threats even from my own family members, and said, you need to apologize what you wrote. This Your is brother and right. sister? No, my brother and sister was here. It's like my cousins, the royal family members, my aunts and uncles. And they had all gone to France. Were they still in France or back you in see, they, this is what This is the division. That's why I said we need to be united. That was a, my uh, the title. The English version says we need to be united. The Khmer version, which we have an editor who's Cambodian translated, said the government controls the royal family, the monarchy. Okay, that's a loss in translation, and that's probably why. But then when we were all called in, when my publisher and the uh, editor-in-chief and said, oh, this says this and this says this, and he goes, mm. well, if you read her column, that's what it's a summary of. Oh. Hmm. So it, that, that could don't be know, the that could be piece too. Of it, sometimes headlines. Or yeah. could be people in the organization. See, money controls people. Doesn't matter if you are a family, friend, money controls you and you could be corrupted by it. So I still to this day don't know. I, I feel like it's, um, I'm still waiting for the answer, but I don't know. I don't know why I was able to survive, because I stayed a year after my father passed away. Just letting you know, I was accused of incitement October 29, 2012. The king dies October 12th. That's why I was, I wrote the column that weekend and I got in trouble two days later. My father dies on December 23rd, 2012. Oh, wow. Yes. So then you had to take responsibility yeah. for all the funeral arrangements. Yes, and, and then my family flew in here like right before Christmas. I was still in trouble, but I think the government kind of like let me uh, honor my father. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, in January, back at it again in the news. Princess Soma 
needs to retract her calm, needs to apologize. Princess Soma, I mean, for for a prime minister to go on TV and to say that, and it, you know, in the news, it's like in the U.S. This is how strong, and it, it's like your name and face is all over the media as a terrorist. So were there any um, factions of the government that supported you or any political there, there parties actually, or the I'm NGOs? I'm going to be honest with community. you, most of them did, but in silent. And some of the royal family, when my father passed away, came out and paid respect and apologized for how they acted, but they were just scared. They are controlled by the government. They think that I can change this. It doesn't take one person to change it. It can help make a change, but I'm not that person. And that we had a lot of criticism that the royal family should have united with me and maybe fought this. But, you know, it, when you're being controlled, it, it's very tough when money has to do with it, property has to do with it. Nobody your wants to lose. Yeah, livelihood. Future. And, you know, when I had a lot of friends in Cambodia, but they're not really your friends because when you get in trouble and you're going through the worst, they're gone. And yet you went ahead <laughs> and you wrote a book. You, I, you took it one step further, perhaps. I, you know, I did, Audrey, because I could not heal when my father passed away. And I was there to um, take care of him and fulfill his wish. And we did. His ashes were passed. It, where the Tonsulat River, Mekong River meets, we were able to honor and everything. But I wrote it because I could not heal in, in public, in private, anything, because everywhere I go is in the news. They don't talk, the government does not like to talk about anybody else that passed away unless you're like the big government official, but they did. They wrote the story in the media and also uh, the, the newspaper and stuff. But they have to say, Princess Soma's father dies. Oh, I, yeah, just yes. that he died. Yes. Yeah, your name mm -hmm. generated the interest. Yes, yes. And then after all that, they gave me my, and you're not supposed to be cremated in the city. Well, my family's from the city, the Pompeii. And like I said, I didn't bring this up, but in 1975, when the Khmer Rouge regime came into the city, they killed all those people. It's because they were in there to kill professionals like doctors and teachers and lawyers, royal family, uh, elite classes. So the people, that is our province. And in the country of Cambodia, we can only be cremated in your own province. Majority of people are the province outside Phnom Penh. So if you were in Phnom Penh, you have to, have to cremate outside. But I don't know what happened. I was able to get cremated in city. So during all this, during my incitement accusation, they're ready to, I, my life was like, I gotta take care of my father's service. My family's coming here. Last minute, you know, I'm calling my sister right before Christmas and can you get the whole family here? Dad just passed away and, you know, I didn't know what was going on, but you, at that time I wasn't thinking about the government. I wasn't caring about what happened to me. I was wanting to take care of my father and I did. And I wrote that book was to heal because I was not healed. And what has been the reaction both in <laughs> Cambodia and elsewhere? Um, the royal family has not read it. They're scared, only one. That is um, Prince uh, uh, Sisa Wat Tomiko and he is in the opposition party now. Um, he's the only one that has the courage to uh, have his book displayed and saying I'm reading it, but nobody wants to touch and read it. Uh, right now, I'm not promoting it in Cambodia. Uh, it Are you will, even permitted to go back to Cambodia this right is, now? Well, Audrey, my life will continue, my story continues, because I have to fly to Cambodia in December, because my father's five-year anniversary of his passing, which is the last one we're doing, and it's a Buddhist ritual, I have to go. Whether I can get in or not, I have to go for my father. My whole family's gonna go. Of course, we're gonna go separate days and yeah. the dates are not going to be together. I would have to get For um, security warning. reasons? Or? Well, they, they couldn't, but I want to go early too, but mm -hmm. that could be too. I have to contact U.S. Embassy. I have to have them be aware that I'm there. As a U.S. citizen, they will protect you because if you anything happens to you, the U.S. will have a say in it. Yeah. Even though I am a Cambodian princess and stuff, but I'm also a U.S. citizen. And what about your siblings, other people here in the States? What has been the reaction? My sister actually read the book and she cried. She didn't know all this happened to me. So it was good to hear that. A lot of my friends have read it and positive feedback. Um, like I said, this book is to heal. They may have been great. shocked to know yes. all this about yes. you and yes. your family growing yes. up with you. Because I hid my college. secret for 40 years. Yeah. And I only exposed it when I moved to Cambodia in 2010. So yes, I am Princess Soma by blood. I have a royal ID. But now because of what happened with me, because we have, a, there's a lot of my cousins and stuff, everybody's a prince, princess. It's like 
a lot in, you know, in France, more in Cambodia, some in Australia, only a few in the U.S. But of course, I'm the most known one because I am known as a royal rebel. But to me, as a rebel, Audrey, it's not a negative term. It's a positive term. That's for what I believe in. It's trying to go against the stand the norm to do good for the better of and your country. One of the things you have done is to start a nonprofit, I understand, I to did. educate young girls. I did. It's the Soma Nordum Foundation, and we are uh, helping girls from a young age to all the way to high school pay for school. So I'm working with a few of the NGO schools in Cambodia and asking them how much does it cost to support one child, and it's not for a couple years, because we have that issue that an NGO will support a child for like a couple years, but what happens to the rest of it? So we want to do it from beginning at age five, because school is very expensive. It's not like a public school, and a lot, 80% of Cambodians are poor. 10% are NGO expat workers, and the other 10 are rural government, family government. So you have 80% poor, and then the 20%. So that's, there's no middle class. It's really bad. So every uh, school, you know, you have people working in the farm and they want their kids to go to school, they can't. Their kids have to work in the farm. So you want to at least help one or two kids from age five to high school to continue. So we find a way to pay for that school. It, you don't have to take 20, 30 kids. One or two is good. We've got one minute left. I can't believe this. And I do want to ask you what your hopes and dreams for the future are for your country, for yourself. and. And, and, and I know there's another yeah. cliffhanger because yes. the promo for your book says that one man you know, made a difference in your life. So I'm just going to leave the audience with that. But what are, what are your hopes for your country? Um, I know there's an election coming July 2018. The country is right now it is not safe. I want a new government. I want hope for my people. And I really just want to pray for right now what's going on in the world. And we just heard this morning the news with another terrorist attack. In the day in, in Las Vegas, yes. Nevada. So I really do hope because I've experienced it and my country has experienced it. So I, I just want just some, a little peace. We might not have peace, but just a little peace and stability for the country of Cambodia. And how will that happen, do you think? I know a we new probably government. have five seconds. It could probably. be another five to a new government. There's hope. My dad had hope. Nobody thought we could go back to the country. He had hope. You can have hope. There's hope. And on that happy note, I do hope there is hope. I've just been a delight to interview you, Thank Princess you. Uh, Soma Noradam. She is a self-declared royal rebel, and that is the title of her book. And thanks so much for being with us Thank on you. At the Table. And thank you for being with us at the table. We'll see you next time.